go. This week on Kentucky Afield. Deer season is quickly approaching and we've got a project that you just might want to try. It's always good whenever you know that you've made something to get out there and catch supper. Next, whitetail isn't the only opportunity on the horizon. See what goes into making early wood duck season possible. Then, the best catfish bait is probably what they're already eating. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Hey, deer archery season is right around the corner, and if you like to fish, this is something you may want to give a try. So today, I'm out trying to do something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and that is take a tail off a deer that I've harvested, tie my own lures, and then go out and successfully catch a fish. Back in September on an archery hunt, I was able to take a doe, and I immediately noticed that the deer had a bunch of different colors in its tail. It had white, it had a lot of brown and red, it had some black, and I immediately thought, man, those are very natural colors that would make a perfect bucktail jig, perfect. I love to smallmouth fish, I love to bass fish, and I thought if I could take those and tie those myself, later in the year, I'm gonna take it out and try to catch fish. Well, we took it down to Cumberland Pro Lures and I had a lady by the name of Charisma Shelton teach me how to tie a bucktail jig. So you've been making bucktail jigs for how many years? 23 years. 23 years. And you're gonna show me Tell today. My age. <laughs> You're gonna show me today how I can take my own deer tail mm -hmm. and make a lure out of it, a smallmouth that I'm gonna to try to target using this bait. It's fun because I mean, it's always good whenever you know that you've made something to get out there and catch supper. You oh know? yeah. Show me what I need to do to get this process started. You see your two little weed guards? We wanna push those forward okay. to get them out of the way. And, and we're using these these heads. These heads are you called your Procaster. Mm -hmm. You guys actually pour these here on the mm -hmm. hooks. But you can go to a tackle store and buy whatever size jig heads and hooks you want. Right. right? Already pre-poured and done. Right. All yes. right, now let's go from here. Tell me what's next. We're gonna start with the thread. And what I like to do is just, I don't, waste anything mm -hmm. so i just put just enough to cover to where it's on there good enough you can get some glue and then your hair going okay i like to have a tie that's tight enough that it's not going to come loose but you use the glue just as an extra bond gotcha okay because when them fish hit them they hit them hard oh yeah so we're going to use your tail Okay. And we're going to do one, what I like to call the color of natural. Okay. And that's the back side of the deer tail. Smallmouth seem to like it. Oh, yeah. I always like to get it as close as I can so that you have your length. And I usually get a couple good cuts because I, I like for it to be a good thick jig. And then here's the, the hardest part of tying is making sure that you hold your hair good. And I cut as close as I can to my fingers. Okay. And then what I like to do before I even start is put a drop of my glue on here. So this looks like fingernail polish. This is actually a glue. It's actually a glue. And it's a waterproof glue. And see how I put that on there? Mm. And I, I spun it around. Mm -hmm. That is what makes it to where it's good and full all the way around, consistent. And then once I've, I've got it started like this, I like to go ahead and just do what I call cosmetic. Gotcha. And all you're doing is you're gonna cover all this that's sticking out from the front there. Gotcha, okay. So you cut, cut you a big, thick piece of it, 
You popped mm -hmm. it on on the shank of the hook, mm -hmm. and then you wrapped it and spread it around so that it completely covers that shank. Yes. And now you're just securing it on there with a bunch Beautifying of... Beautifying it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now what we're gonna do is make a knot. Okay. And whenever you pull your thread back, you wanna wrap your fingers around it and you're coming around the head. Okay. And I like to do that a couple times. Okay. And then I break it off into the bait so it's in there, mm -hmm. and then anything that's sticking up, I like to go ahead and cut that. Snip it off. Mm-hmm. And then I'll take my glue and go all the way around it. And that way, you know that you've got a really good tie. I go ahead and push my little weed guards back. Oh yeah, you got something holding it, so you might mm -hmm. as well. And then here we go. Now that is a beautiful, beautiful jig. The main thing is just getting that hair on there and holding it mm -hmm. and getting everything in place. Once you get into place, it's easy peasy. I'm telling you right now, this will catch fish. Big fish swirled right there. Here we go. All right, let me grab that net. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna just throw this one in. There we go. Man, this is a fish that's just come out of super cold, cold water. You ought to feel how cold this fish is to the touch. I got back in here, hooked a pretty good smallmouth, got it right up to the boat, and now this fish. This fish here is, uh, you know, it's knocking on, it's over three and a half pounds. Let's see what we got here. Right at 20 inches long. It is really, really cool to think that you took a September successful archery hunt, turned it into a bag full of jigs, and brought them down here, and lo and behold, turn a September doe hunt into a beautiful smallmouth bass. I'll tell you what, uh, there's something kind of special about that. Let's get this fish back in the water. <music> Lieutenant McQuarrie, one of our most popular hunting seasons is right around the corner, and that's dove season. Tell me what a person needs to think about before entering the woods for dove hunting. Before entering the woods to dove hunt, first and foremost, you need to make sure that you're hunting a legal field, that the field has not been baited. Okay. Secondly, check your gun. Make sure it's not capable of holding more than three shells. We see that a lot of times with new guns. They don't have the plug in them. So always, even if it's a new gun, check to make sure it does have the plug in it. And once you've checked your gun and you've bought your hunting license, there also is a survey that you need to take to get a number. It's called a HIP number. Tell me about that. When you get your license, it's gonna ask you if you hunted migratory birds or waterfowl the previous year. If you answer yes, you're gonna be required to complete a hip survey. All right, there's one it's gonna give you a number. You need yep. to make sure you have that on your license before you go dove hunting. And the, the HIP, the HIP stands for what now? Harvest Information Program. Okay, so that's why we collect data to find out who was successful the year before. And how many birds were taken. Okay, so once you get in the field, there's some other things you need to consider. You do. You need to make sure first and foremost that you're being safe. Okay. But we're looking at not shooting at low flying birds and making sure what the background is behind your target. You may be in a field that's in a congested area in certain places you may not be able to shoot. For instance, there may be a house, barn, or vehicles parked. So you need to know when you're shooting a shotgun, it's multiple pellets coming out of a shell, not just one single projectile. So you need to consider that and make sure you're not peppering other targets around it other than the game you're actually after. You should always wear eye and ear protection as well. Shooting a shotgun, being out there in the field, you're looking up, people shooting from across the field, you wanna make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Absolutely, and as you're successful, you wanna to try to keep your birds separate from the person that's beside you. You don't wanna pile birds together. At the end of the day, Chad, if I decide to give you my birds, I need to make sure I leave you a paper that has my signature, my address, the date the birds were taken, and the number by species. Okay, so it is fine to share birds at the end of the day with an individual. You just have to have them separated until they've been processed, and then you leave a, a carcass tag, right? That's exactly right, Chad. And the limit is 15 per day. It's 15 per day. Dove seeding is one of my favorite times. If you like shooting a shotgun, then you're gonna like dove hunting. 
Most people that hunt would consider themselves to be conservationists, but the next time you pull the trigger on a wood duck, you may be helping us gather some useful information. He's putting out the uh, rocket charges, so I'm gonna go ahead and put the bait out. And we put the bait basically two foot from the net. It seems close, but that's how close you actually have to have them up next to the net to catch them. For whatever reason, I was thinking they were going up, but they're not going up at all. They're really just shooting along the ground. Well, the, the, the power of the rocket, like when we shoot, it's amazing. These these T posts will be almost at a 45 degree angle. Really? Because it's got that much force that it'll actually push the rocket. So when they when that propulsion hits, it's gonna shoot the rocket up high. It's much higher than what you would imagine. So right now what we're doing is we're just opening up these rockets here. And once he gets the bait put out and we're ready to shoot the rockets, we'll put the rockets in, hook them up to the, the detonator cord, and we'll be ready to shoot the rockets off them. But this is the most important part right here, is actually attaching the net <laughs> to the rocket. So here we're here at Slough. This is my first time at the Slough WMA. How many acres is this WMA? The entire WMA is roughly 11,000 acres. Oh, wow. Where we're at here, it's called the Saw Heaver Unit. Okay. And the Saw Heaver Unit is where our waterfowl refuge is at, and it's kind of where we do the most of our active management for waterfowl. All right, Greg, if you want to do a quick rundown behind me and just double check me. Clevises are all tight. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll walk back to the blind and uh, we'll chest our connection with the galvanometer. Okay. And then after that, we'll be we'll be set. Everything is set and ready to go. We've got our help and your biologist back there just waiting for the blast. Now it's just a waiting game. And it's not a waiting game to see a few birds show up. It's really, you're trying to maximize your numbers here, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to time it of when we shoot the net that we have the most number of birds up on the bay. They need to be pretty much a couple feet from the net to be confident that you can catch them. So they need to be right there up where we put the bait at. I'd say kind of up their feet right now, there's probably about 50 or 60. And I know it doesn't look like it, but they're not close enough yet to the net. What they'll usually do is they'll do that. And why they do that, it's actually not a bad thing. You know, as long as they stay close, which they, they did. So what, what's back then? I don't know. They'll do this three or four times. I think they just start getting kind of they don't like being up on that sand away from the water. So you gotta be kind of quick on the draw when you pull the trigger so that when they're coming up that you do it before they flush because they'll give you maybe a minute or two before they'll do that. Hopefully those birds come back because that makes me nervous if they get up and actually fly away. They're coming right back. Guys, I might actually attach the detonator. I see some birds that from that left are starting to move up. So, more than likely from what I'm seeing, if we get another big push like that, I'm pulling the trigger. Because they, they fed quite a bit right there. So they might not give us another good shot. I don't think it's going to get much better than this. We got a few that are still in the water, but yeah, we got a, a vast majority of them against the net. And they've been feeding for quite a while, so I won't want to give them much of a chance. You guys ready? Let's go. So 
what do I have to, what do you need to help? Just kind of pull these nets out. Just make sure no birds are gonna get out or any ones that are tangled real bad. From what we had, that's that's a pretty good shot. Oh yeah. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Yeah, that's a good shot. Oh man. Some of them were, I mean, literally right up against they the were. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. How's it going? Good, yourself? Oh, pretty good. About to trap in this one. Yeah, <laughs> well, something different for me. Pretty cool. All right, we got all the rockets. All right, guys, start, start picking. So now the process, we've shot the uh, rockets and we've got a hundred and something ducks in here, most likely. And now the biologists will be pulling the ducks and bringing them over. And this is the banding station. You can see here they've got four or five different categories. Immature males, adult males, immature females, and adult females. And they're gonna look at them right here and decide what they are, and then band it accordingly. And then, once that happens, they'll turn these birds loose pretty quickly. First bird wasn't until 5.30. They've been late all summer, though. Crazy, these new generation ducks. These are millennial wood <laughs> millennial ducks. Millennial ducks, yeah, they think they been <laughs> late. They had to stop and get their Starbucks coffee. <laughs> This is an immature male, and see how straight it is? Now on the females, they're more of a teardrop. V-notched, see how it's got a V-notch right mm -hmm. here? That tells right off the bat that it's an immature. You got a male and a female, both of them immature. Both immature. So Kentucky, Tennessee, and Florida, um, a lot of people don't realize, are the only three states in the country that have a early wood duck season. Okay. So us catching these wood ducks is extremely important, especially here in Kentucky, because without that banding data, we can't justify having the season. Hmm. We really need to have these birds banded because we have such a high take during that September season. Mm -hmm. By getting these bands put on these birds, you know, we can really monitor the population. You know, we get a lot of people that come here to wood duck in the early season. So we, we know how important that is to our sportsmen and we know how important it is for us I mean, to continue like, to be able to have that opportunity for our sportsmen to get this data out. Because like I had said, without this data, we can't justify having that September season. So, you know, for our sportsmen to have this opportunity, we know we gotta put the work in. Throughout the years here on Kentucky Field, we've highlighted many unique baits for catching catfish. One of the best may have been Asian carp. So Jim, I think this is the fourth show that you and I have done together. And I never know what we're gonna fish for. I always just say, hey, what would you fish for today? And today you said catfish. Catfish. Go ahead. Hop in? Yeah. Right. What are you predominantly catching? Are we looking at blues, channel blues. cat? Blues, yeah, okay. target blues mostly. And blue catfish, for a lot of people don't know, that they, they get really big. Yep. They can get really, really they big. They can. And I'm watching for bait now. <laughs> okay. We're looking for floater Asian carp. Oh, okay. So. What does that tell you? Just easy to get it. Get easy bait, just go oh, pick it up off yeah. top of water, you know. You. That one's a little bit too done. <laughs> This is not the first time that you and I went out and you've just adapted because you assume that the fish have adapted their feeding and they're eating Asian carp. Yes. So you fish with Asian carp quite a bit, don't you? Quite often, yeah. yeah. Man, we got shark in here? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's what you're talking about, coming to the turbines right there. Yes. It just took the head right off. And I'll tell you one thing, that's about as fresh as it gets. That's a perfect one right there now. I tell you, two alt circle hook and catch just about any fish in the river, you know. There's a lot of strength in, in that right there. Yeah. It's a lot stronger than your line. Yep, <laughs> set your drag right and take your time. This is our three-way rig that I use for 90% of my striper fishing and catfish. Our old buddy, Hope Carlton. Oh yeah. Remember old Hope? This is the rig that he used to use. You can tell these are hands that have tied many, 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 many of these knots. You do it so quick and fast. Time in my sleep, my wife has to wear a shower cap to bed at night. <laughs> you started braiding her hair? I do. I tire <laughs> had her hair in knots much. She just started wearing a shower cap. So. <laughs> this is what the loop is for. 
you can change the size of your weight really easy. Yeah. Go all the way to the bottom and then pull it up a couple cranks and that's where we're gonna reside, right? Yes. You Let me tell get me in. you tell me when and where and we'll make it happen. In the spot here, you gotta be lined up just right, you know. When did you discover that these uh, air bladders were pretty good bait? Just start trying things, you yeah. Know. Oh yeah. You know, anytime you can find something that there's an abundance of that's easy to easy to get, then it makes good bait. That's that's <laughs> makes your life easier, huh? Look, yep. there we go. Put that uh -oh. on there. You got one too. Look at here. Look at there. What do you know? I was just about ready to reel this thing up because I did not want to get wrapped up in you. No. Now, who's going to net it? <laughs> oh, I, we can. We'll figure it out. No, that that is a perfect size blue catfish. That. What do you think? Weight, weighs about five pounds or better? I'd say close to five. A better fish than mine. And you think these things aren't eating well? Look at the belly on that fish. We've had a line in the water for about it's been a while. Six minutes. This rate will will sink the boat in about an hour and a half. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Fishing's fun, but there's got to be a little catching involved. You know? <laughs> I've never had to have much patience when I come with you try a bait and you don't get many bites or whatever kind of slow change baits. Finally, finally there got you another go. fish. Grab that net. That's okay. You don't think it's nah, I need a net? We'll just pick him up. Or we can catch another. How does that fish here bite? With his mouth. With his lips, huh? You know? <laughs> He bounced so around we, there a little bit. We did get a did get a bite on that uh, on that new secret bait you got there. Yeah. Here we go. This technique today that you've decided to go with is just use for bait whatever the river gives us. Right. Let's do it. Probably don't really want to know what he's saying. <laughs> No, probably not. All we need is more of them. <laughs> well, I'm having a blast. Uh, Feels like a little, channel cat. A little bit of shake there. It is a channel cat. There you go. Man calls it off of the head shake. He knew what he had. Now what, uh, as far as just table fare, which one do you prefer? Blues are hard to beat, but these are, they're good also. This is a pretty good one right here. He's got me doubled over. You lose that fish, I'm just gonna push you in. <laughs> yeah, I deserve it. Get out. <laughs> he didn't break that, he just come off. I was actually sitting there loosening the drag or getting ready. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, that's better. What, now, I don't know what happened there. Jim, that's a pretty solid fish. That's pretty nice. That is a pretty good fish right there. Let me get him a little bit closer. There you go. Thank you, man. That's a that's a pretty good fish. I don't know what that fish did. He just made a bust, a burst up, and I lost contact with him. This is a good fish. I think we'll probably turn this one loose. What do you think? I think so. And that's what it's all about. Take what you need, put some back. That's a that's a big. Look at him. He broke his fin off. He lost his handle. That fish is probably thirty something inches long and fat and thick and strong. Got another? We got a double on. This right here is why you come out here and fish below the dam. D you didn't even have to bring bait. You just picked up what the river gave you, and lo and behold, it's our second double of the day. <laughs> you got you a blue there. And for someone who says that that likes the catfish and says, man, I can't believe you're, uh, you're taking a couple of these. You're a man that makes your living off coming down here and putting people on catfish. Taking a mess home for the fryer every now and then is not gonna hurt a thing, is it? Not at all, not at all. Again, couldn't be any fatter. Belly's about to burst, it's so fat. Well, thanks again, it's always a blast. Thank you. You're a lot of fun to be out here in the boat with, that's for sure. 
we only had to go a half a mile and caught all we wanted and had to come back. The cooler's completely full. Yeah, now we gotta clean them. Now we gotta clean them. Finally, tough season is here. Grab that shotgun and get to the field. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.